Hi guys. I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about the statistical exercise for this week. It's uh, this, is, this is sort of a breakthrough moment for this class because we're switching from understanding Bayes' principle from a sort of manual step-by-step -step process to using a much more sophisticated tool. And I want to introduce it in the right way. So let's go ahead and talk. This is the notebook for the communication, which we already went through in the Ed puzzle for this week. I'm going to skip down to the bottom and point out that there's a link at the bottom to the statistics exercises, which are also available in the Project 4 folder. It's called the Mystery of Statistical Significance. So let me, uh, let's click on that link, or you can just go straight to the notebook from, from the folder. And I really want you to read this. I wrote this uh, over the last week or so, and uh, I'm not going to just read it to you because that's silly, um, but I would like you to read this. This picture is a super important picture. Um, let me, it's important because it's terrible. Okay, uh, let's see if I can zoom it down just a little bit. So, in prior years, I have taught this course with the notion of having everybody learn a standard technique in statistics called hypothesis testing. And it's horribly convoluted. Um, the basic plan is you figure out your situation and then you follow this flowchart depending on the type of data you have, whether it's discrete or continuous, and then you go, well, if it's a continuous distribution, um, are there dependent and independent variables, or are you looking at differences? And then depending on what differences you're looking at, is it means, is it variances, is it multiple means? Uh, there's all these decisions that have to be made. <coughs> and uh, ultimately, what you're doing in this business is you're the, the, the way this hypothesis testing works is you come up with the question that you're interested in answering. Does my treatment of this uh, system improve performance or not, right? Or something. I don't know what the question is. But the goofy thing about the traditional hypothesis testing is you want to know if the thing works. But the way you have to formulate the question is you say, um, it doesn't work. So you, you make a null hypothesis, was it, which is that my treatment doesn't do anything. And then what you do is you collect a bunch of data and you perform a bunch of statistical tests. And th that's what this flowchart is all about, is identifying what statistical test you're going to use to prove that this question that you're not interested in, which is that it doesn't work, you're going to prove that that question, the answer is no, that it, the answer to the question, it doesn't work, does it, ah, the question is, you see how Howard this is? Uh, the null hypothesis is that nothing, that the thing doesn't do anything. And you're going to collect data and perform a statistical test to try to prove that that's wrong, that it does do something. But the question, but you don't know what it does, you just know it doesn't do nothing. I mean, really, you're spending all your time trying to prove that, noth that, noth that nothing happens is, is not correct. It's horrible. It's, so forget it. What I've decided this year is I'm not doing it. I'm going to do something completely different. And you noticed I've been bringing up all this Bayesian analysis. That's because the Bayesian analysis, while it is, at some level, it looks more complicated, it's actually a whole lot simpler. Because you can just ask the question, how big is the effect of this treatment? You don't ask the question, is there no effect, or prove that there's not no effect. You're proving, you're measuring a quantity. How big is the effect? And if that quantity shows that it definitely is uh, a certain size, then you can decide that that effect is big enough that I, I can I can make that work. That that will be worthwhile <laughs> worthwhile for me to do. So anyway, the first section describes the null hypothesis business. We're not doing that. Uh, you'll probably have to do it at some point in your life because it's ubiquitous. Most people do null hypothesis testing, or, or they formulate things in terms of uh, null hypotheses. Um, I'm not going to propose that we do that. I propose that we use Bayesian analysis all the way through. And um, I want to point out that um, you've already been doing some Bayesian analysis. The socks, the three different dice, 
uh, the bowls of fruit, those were all Bayesian analysis systems where we were trying to use data to improve our understanding of what is going on. The randomness in Bayesian analysis comes from our knowledge. It doesn't come from the system. The system is the system. Our knowledge of what's going on is the problem that we're trying to improve. So it's philosophically, it's very different from the traditional sort of statistical analysis approach. So what I wanted to do was to go back to this example that we did earlier in the semester where we have a distribution of numbers and we know that the mean is 25 and, and the standard deviation is 6. We can generate a bunch of those guys randomly and I can do st work with them and try to see how could I interpret the data to try to infer something about that distribution. So what I want to point out, I'm, I'm actually in the notebook here, I'm going to go through this process manually. Now before I do that, I just want you to know that I'm not expecting you to go through the process manually. I'm setting this up so you can understand how it works. Ultimately, you're going to be using this more sophisticated software, which I introduced down here after the section that says manual is hard. Okay, So I'm not making you do it manually. I'm going to show you how to do it manually so that you can understand what's going on but you're actually going to use this other package, this Python package called PyMC3. It's Monte, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, and it's actually quite easy. It doesn't take a lot of code, and you just describe your model to the system, and it cranks away, and it gives you answers. It's a machine that knows how to do Bayesian inference, and it, it just basically gives you the result. So it's, it's just lovely, um, and it's very general. So if you can formulate a model, it can process that model and give you the answer. You just have to be able to think clearly about what the model is and how it works. Okay, so let's, uh, and I'm not going to try to do this all in one swell foop, but I do, I want to just walk through the manual case and then you can, and we can talk in class about the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, okay, so here's the idea. We've got a bunch of data from this distribution and here I'm I'm, uh, I want to take some of that data and use it to f estimate the likelihood of sigma and mu having certain values. So remember that, like with the three dice, I knew it was either a four-sided die, a six-sided die, or an eight-sided die. And I was using the data to distinguish between those three. In this case, I know that the mean is going to be somewhere in here, and the standard deviation is going to have some size. And what I want to do is make a bunch of hypotheses. The mean is this and the standard deviation is that. So what I do down here is I make a series of sigmas and a series of mu's. Linspace, as you've learned, uh, in this case, it gives me uh, a, a range of sigmas from 0 to 20, and I have 41 options. And then mu's, I go from 10 to 50, and I have uh, 41 options. So it it lists them all here. What are the values of sigma? What are the values of mu? And um, this just puts them in a list. So here it's um, sigma is 0, mu is 10. Sigma is 0.5, mu is 10. Sigma is 1, mu is 10, and so on. And I get all the possible combinations of sigma and mu. Of course, if there are 41 of each, that's going to be 41 times 41, which is going to be something like uh, what? 1600 different hypotheses that I've got to choose between. So that's quite a number. Um, but then what I do is I create a PMF and I list all those hypotheses and there they are. 0 and 10, 0.5 and 10, 1 and 10, and they're, they're all there. And the probability of each one is a, a number. It's going to be something like 1 over 1600, right? Because that's how many hypotheses there are. And each one is going to begin equally likely. OK? So now the idea is uh, I need to be able to figure out, given a piece of data, I want to know what's the likelihood of that data for each of these hypotheses. In other words, our likelihood functions are now going to be arrays of numbers which say what's the likelihood of this data for each of these different 1600 hypotheses which are combinations of different possible values of mu and different possible values of sigma. So what I have here, uh, I've got a function. It's called 
likelihood for data, and it's based on the Gaussian distribution. I'm, remember, I'm assuming this is a Gaussian distributed uh, probability distribution. It's got a mean and it's got a sigma. I give you a piece of data, and this is how I calculate the probability of seeing that data given those parameters, mu and sigma. It's kind of the other way around than we normally calculate it. Normally we say, I give you mu and I give you si sigma, and I want to know what's the probability of different values of x. Here we're turning that on its ear, and we're saying, you give me a value of x, now I'm looking at what's the probability of different values of mu and different values of sigma for that particular x. Does that make sense? And so that's what this function does. It takes e to the minus, uh, whatever the data value is, minus mu, right, x minus mu, squared, divided by 2 sigma squared, and I divide the whole thing by sigma. I'm not worried about the square root of 2 pi, because remember, we normalize this thing after every step, so the normalization out in front doesn't really make any difference. Um, what I'm going to do here is, given my hypotheses, I'm going to go through all the hypotheses, calculate the likelihood of each one, and put them in an array, or a list in this case. And then update is just the same old update business. For all the data in my list of data, I'm going to get the likelihood for that data, multiply it by the hypotheses, and keep updating that. And at the end, I renormalize the whole lot. Okay, And then I end up with a bunch of uh, normalized hypotheses. So here I'm going to go through and create the PMF. I'm going to update the hypotheses. I'm just going to use 100 data points. Okay, And then I'm going to look at the uh, result. Which, which hypothesis has the maximum? So that's what this function argmax says. It tells me which hypothesis is the maximum. It turns out it's hypothesis 628. It's got a probability of 0.23, which is at 6.5 and 25. So if you look down here, that's right about 6.5, and the mu is right around 25. Notice that that's pretty close. 25 is right about where the maximum in my probability distribution is. So you'll notice that this searches th through all this parameter space, and it finds this region right here where the probability is highest. So um, that's sort of the way it works. Now, I did all this manually. Uh, you could also write a function. Here's a function that goes through and does all that stuff. It finds the sigs, it finds the mu's, it creates the hypotheses, it sets up the PMF, it updates the hypotheses, and then it finds the maximum and graphs it. So, and I just checked it again with my original numbers to see that it gives me the same result, and it looks like it does, right? Um, and then I said, well, wait a minute, why are we searching out here where we know the parameters are not right? Let's focus in on this region around the maximum and take a closer look. So that's what this, by making this a function, I can sort of go in and play. So I'd go from 5.5, sigma goes from 5.5 to 8, and mu goes from 23 to 27, and then I get a distribution like this, and you can see very clearly where the maximum in the mu is and where the maximum in the sigma is. It's a nice, smooth process. Um, I could also, this is with the 100 data points, I could also do the same thing with 200 data points, and you'll notice that the, this is the same range in the grid, but you'll notice how it, it zooms in. The range is much smaller now, and that's because I've added more data, so my belief is narrowed. My region of credibility, the credible region, has gotten smaller. And that's the nature of Bayesian hypothesis. Uh, Bayesian analysis. As you add more data, you become more and more certain about the answer. That's the idea. Okay? So anyway, that got us down to manual is hard. I want to point out that um, it's the I'm solving the same problem here, and then I go and use the, uh, the uh, fancy machinery to do that. If I do it with 100 data points, I end up with basically the same answer. You can plot the same thing, sigma and mu. But the nice thing about the fancy machinery is I can actually <laughs> go in and use uh, all the data, 10,000 data points. That would This process, running this notebook for the 200 data points, here, 200, I should have changed the plot to say 200 data points. Um, the, uh, this takes a long time to run. It goes through many, many, many iterations before it's finished. This thing finishes in 14 seconds. And I can switch to um, 10,000 data points, and it finishes in 16 seconds. 
So 10,000 data points in the manual approach would probably take days. So it's just completely un impossible to to do it that way in the manual approach. But in this, uh, and the other thing is, as as I'll show later in this example, um, you can handle much more complicated models. So here's a model that you could use in your project for this week, where you want to demonstrate that there's a real effect as a result of your whatever the experiment is you're doing. Um, and it's got uh, a, a bunch more parameters. Realize that every time you add a parameter in the brute force approach, you're adding another dimension. So right now we have a two-dimensional space, mu and sigma. If I add another parameter, that's three-dimensional. If I add another parameter, it's four-dimensional. And I'm having to, each time, I have to multiply by the number of points in that dimension. And it becomes very difficult very quickly. So anyway, that's all. I, I'm, I'm going to stop now. I'm very excited about this. I hope you guys uh, appreciate how cool it is, and we'll see you guys tomorrow.